Welcome to Moving Conversations, a podcast for movement professionals by movement professionals. If you coach, train, or teach movement, Pilates, or fitness, then this podcast is for you. With more than 60 years of experience in fitness and Pilates, your hosts, Brian Ritchie and Nora St. John, explore the science of human movement, diving deep into the facts, myths, and common misconceptions, hoping to spark thought and conversation about how we view fitness and movement. Now, let's jump into Moving Conversations. And welcome back to Moving Conversations. I'm Brian Ritchie. Joining me as always is Nora St. John. Good morning, Nora. How you doing? Very well, Brian. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm excited about today's session. I'm excited. I am too. This is, this is such a, it's such a troublesome area. Yes. The troublesome triad. Yes, ma'am. It really, it, 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 it is such the root of so many uh, pain, pain issues, so much discomfort for clients. Yep. And honestly, Maybe I'm being a little bit obnoxious, but it's not always that hard to manage that piece of things. Mm -hmm. right? I find like there's some kind of simple ways to work with some of that that can really make a huge difference using relatively simple tools and time frames for a client. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the triad we're talking about, okay, the troublesome triad is going to be hip flexor, piriformis, yep. and quadratus yep. lumborum. And these are three areas yep. that are always considered bad guys. Anytime you hear someone talk about it, it's always put into a negative context. Oh, it's my hip flexor. Oh, it's my piriformis. Oh, it's my QL. And it's like, okay, these are all very dynamic muscle units. These are things that involve a lot of what we do every day in just normal motion. And when one of them is shut off or one of them isn't working properly or one of them is in spasm or it throws everything else into chaos. So I thought, you know what? Let's cover all three. Let's talk about it. We'll break it down a little bit and then talk about how they work sort of in conjunction with each other and how they do affect the lumbar spine and low back pain. So why don't we start good. first with anatomy? Uh, let's start first with the hip flexor. All right. So hip flexors, there's many of them. Mm -hmm. The key ones that we talk about and actually the reason a lot of these are part of the troublesome triad is that they're multi-joint muscles. Yep. They don't just cross one joint, they cross multiple joints. So the hip flexor we're talking about is primarily the psoas major, right? Psoas major attaches to the front of the vertebra, the transverse processes and the intervertebral discs of T12, L1, L2, L3, L4, sometimes L5, depending who you talk to. Yep. Right, then it comes across the front of the pelvis right on top of the iliacus, merges with the iliacus, creating that connection between a, a one joint hip flexor, the mm -hmm. iliacus, and this multi-joint, I'm not even just gonna call it hip flexor, uh, the psoas major. Right. To attach the lesser trochanter inside the femur. And what's interesting about this that, I guess no one really talks, everybody hears hip flexor, so immediately they go into the hip joint. They only talk about the hip, the hip, the hip, the hip. And it wasn't until I, you know, learn more about anatomy and even in anatomy, they didn't really go into much detail about this, but how important is it that the psoas does attach to the lumbar spine? It's huge. It, it's the only thing in the front of the lumbar spine, yeah. except for the crosses of the diaphragm that come down to only to, to L3 on one side on the, the right side and L2 on the left side. Yeah. So, so that's the only, it's the only muscular support we have for the front of the spine. Everything else is in the back, and there's like 17 layers in the back, but there's very few layers in the front. Yeah, and for those people who have issues that they, they shouldn't be doing extension work, they shouldn't go into arching their back, these muscles, the psoas, when it contracts, especially bilaterally, will help put you into more extension. So the tighter that is, which is why we see people say they have a tight hip flexor, and yes, they may be pitched forward at the hip, they also oftentimes have that lordosis that goes along with it. And people aren't addressing that part of it. They only address the lower portion in a hip stretch, in a hip flexor stretch, without really thinking about the lumbar. And I'm going to get even a little more compl complicated oh. here because um, the psoas major attaches to each of those vertebrae in the lumbar. Depending on the shape of the lumbar curve, mm -hmm. those muscles can respond quite differently. Mm. So one thing that I'll say there is, is if, for example, that lumbar curve is extremely stiff, or there's just not a lot of mobility there, then the psoas will generally pull the entire lumbar forward into extension. 
Mm-hmm. Right, increase the lordosis, if you will, along typically with flexing the hip, right? But that's not always the case. Um, if somebody has either a looser lumbar or a lumbar that is flatter, mm-hmm. right, less less curved, then I've, I've, I've experienced this with some clients, then the psoas actually acts as a sequential flexor of the lumbar spine. Hmm. Very so interesting. So, you know, in, in Pilates, if you're doing a roll up or more commonly a roll down or, or the roll up, because I'm going to do the concentric action of that, um, you can sometimes really get uh, into almost segmentally activating the psoas, or that's how it feels anyway. Um, what's happening, you know, from a, a musculoskeletal condition, I'm not really sure, but it feels like you can articulate, articulate one vertebra at a time into flexion by activating different branches mm-hmm. of that psoas, different segments of it, if you will. Interesting. I always put that as when you think of a roll up, for instance, I always mm-hmm. thought, and again, it could be a fallacy on my end, or if I'm just dealing with people who have relatively stiffer spines that want to, that naturally go into that extension when the hip flexor gets tight. When they do try and do a roll up, they usually don't have that capability of curling the spine and they're yanking right. from the lower end of the, of the psoas iliacus yep. connection. Yep. Yep. So yep. that's sort of yanking it up. And these are the people who do have a harder time, like I say, doing more of a curl. They're the ones that sort of come up from the hip joint itself. And I, cause, right. so, and that could yeah. go yeah, to so- what you were saying with them being just having stiffer spines. Right. So we, I, call, I call it the Frankenstein. Yes. Right? Yes. And, and, you know, Pilates, we do, we do roll ups a lot. We can, you know, curl up and roll up yep. and you'll see the thoracic spine goes into flexion mm-hmm. and you see like more or less articulation of the, of the cervical than into the thoracic. And then it kind of like the whole thing comes up as a chunk. Yep. Right. Cause the psoas basically pulls on the front of those lumbar vertebrae and lifts the whole thing up as a piece. Yep. And that's, that's very typical. But the reason that this occurred to me, or one of the reasons was I was teaching in China and again, general, this is a broad generalization of structural differences across different cultures and stuff. Um, but in, in China, in general, the spine is a bit flatter. There's typically a, bit, a little bit less of a lordotic curve. Mm-hmm. There's not always as much gluteal development. Again, this is broad categorizations. And I watched a room of 75 people who had never done Pilates before do a roll up without with, with, with actually articulating the lumbar spine into flexion. Mm-hmm. Which I, I, again, if I've got a mixed, you know, American version in a classroom, that's going to be about two people. Maybe that can do that right. or not, or nobody can. And so, and I was looking at like, why is this so different? And then having worked again a lot, a lot in Asia, um, looking at just how the spinal mechanics are different. If you've got a steeper curve, you're going to get a pull. Let's say the psoas attaches. Uh, let's say let's say you've got a curve in the lumbar that has an apex at L2. So the the, the deepest part of the extension is at L2, right, the second lumbar vertebra. Then everything from L2, L3, L4 uh, is going to pull that whole thing up. As right. Unit. So if you're going to roll up, it's going to yeah, it's going to pull it up as a unit, and create maybe potentially some shearing forces into the lumbar spine. Mm-hmm. Whereas if that spine does not have that deep lordotic curve, I, I just find that the mechanics are quite different. And there was a, a study I read a million years ago that, that really spoke to how the position of the spine directly influences the tone in the different fibers of the psoas, both the deep fibers and the more superficial fibers. Uh, and, and you can kind of see that, that if somebody's really stiff there, they're going to have that the, the psoas are going to pull that lumbar forward into more extension. And you'll often see along with that that they're slightly flexed at the hips. They may or may not be anteriorly tipped in the pelvis. Mm-hmm. Um, and all that goes together. Right. But depending on the spinal structure and the spinal mobility, that could be that could be different. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I'd say 95% of the people that I work with have much more of that steeper lordotic curve. Uh, either yeah. with sway back posture or just to generalize, low, you know, larger lordosis. So they do have that almost natural anterior tilt, tight hip flexor, can't seem to release it, can't seem to stretch it without, you know, going into a deep lumbar extension, which I hate to say I see that taught constantly at gyms everywhere I go, where you go into a lunge sort of position. Yeah. 
and yep. you're stretching it. But what happens is they start arching their back. And I'm thinking, you're not really stretching much. No, exactly. Because that lump, you're basically taking the two ends of the muscle, right? And yep. you may be moving the femur behind you. So yep. the trochanter is going behind you, but the spine goes forward. Yep, exactly. And you're not necessarily changing the length between those two attachment points, exactly. which is what you need for a stretch, right? And that's yeah. sometimes how I'll teach it with a client is I'll let them go into what's natural. I say, how much of a stretch do you feel? And they'll say, yeah. oh, a little bit. Not much. A little bit. Yeah. I'll say, okay. And as tight as they are, I'm like, you should be feeling a ton. And of course, then you put them into a flatter back position or a posterior tilt and have them move just a little bit. And all of a sudden, like, oh my gosh, I feel this so much more. Right, so that's what you mean. Yeah, you're creating that anchor basically with the lumbar yeah. spine. So yeah. you're holding one end of the muscle while you're stretching the other instead of letting it right, move. Right, which, which, which is what you have to do, right? If you, actually, yep. you know, if you want to stretch a muscle, you've got to stabilize one end yep. so the other end can do its movement. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. That is interesting. That is interesting. Because we see a lot of people who have sort of locked up hip flexors. Uh, recently, yeah. I went through this uh, a couple of weeks ago, just woke up, you know, must have slept a little funny, woke up and I was like, man, it is so tight. And mm. it didn't want to let go. It just was like a ball. And I needed to get in there and do a little bit of release work myself uh, and to get it to relax because stretching wasn't doing the job. So I actually needed some manual work and, you know, fortunately, you can do that with a small ball if you know where to place it. And that really did seem to help release it. But it took probably a week before everything sort of relaxed and let go. So I do see that some people do have that chronically tight psoas. And I'm, I'm using the word psoas instead of iliopsoas because I don't often see it in the iliacus as much. I normally see it in the psoas area. Uh, and yeah. And that's the part that, again, will pull you into extension, which can cause other issues if you've got you know, other issues like stenosis or whatever. So yeah, doing a little bit of manual work, if you can have someone do manual work, it's a great way to get that to let go. But also just using a small ball, anything you can do to release it mm -hmm. seems to help. Absolutely. One thing that I, I just always caution people on is because releasing this yourself is a little tricky. It is. It's not because you really have to put a small ball or I sometimes will use like the edge of a roller. Yep. Um, basically right inside the iliac crest, right, right inside the ASIS and kind of relax into it and hopefully get that muscle to relax. Yep. And, and, you know, typically manual pressure helps. It's very hard to do that amount of manual pressure yourself. Mm -hmm. Some people can, but it's, it's a funny angle to go in on. So uh, manual therapy helps out there. And one thing I, I sometimes caution on that is if there's any kind of inflammatory issue in in the abdomen, if there's mm -hmm. endometriosis, if there's irritable bowel issues, if there's other kinds of things, yep. um, I, I want to be really cautious with that because I'm not quite sure what all I'm poking in there, but I'm poking a lot of things. I was just going to say um, that's huge as a contraindication yeah. for females, yeah. I find especially. Yeah. Uh, I had yeah. a client who needed release work there. I taught her how to do it with a, with a you know small ball. She got into position and she literally said that if all of a sudden she goes, whoa. And I was thinking, ooh, did we get a release? And she said, it felt like rushing warm water in that oh. area. And I'm like, ooh, that's, uh, that, I, I, don't, I don't like that. That's not, that's right. not, that's, that's, <laughs> that's okay. a little scary. It's a little scary. But I said, oh, do you feel okay? She goes, no, I feel fine in it. And she had fibroid. She had uh, uh -huh. ovarian cyst is what she had. Uh -huh. She had uh -huh. an ovarian cyst and it literally... I, the doctor Did said she ruptured the cyst. She ruptured the cyst. Wow. Because she went to the yeah. doctor. I said, you know what? I want you to go into your OB. I want you yeah. to get this checked out because this is not a normal situation. Right. This is weird. This yeah. is weird. And she felt fine afterwards. But when she went in, the doctor said, yeah, you, we can see you have signs that it was there and uh -huh. you ruptured it. So that's wow. something that she didn't know <laughs> she had. So you do have to be very yes. careful with this. Yes, you do. Exactly. And I am going to caution, there is a new tool out there that I've seen being advertised throughout mm. social media land, which it's very pointy. It's probably six, uh, four to six inches tall uh, and it's quite pointy. And you're supposed uh, to put it underneath where your psoas is and lie down on it. And it looks yeah. a little bit on the large side to me. It's very pinpointy. Right. It does not look comfortable at all. It looks like a torture device. Uh, yeah. some people swear by it, but I'm going to caution, unless you yeah. know what you're doing, there's a lot of things yeah. in that area that 
you can really, you don't want to be messing with. Right. So I always say, be cautious. Just start yeah. light. Start lighter rather than harder because you don't know what you're poking into. No, and that's why I start with, you know, I start with a big ball, like a five inch, you know, five inch yeah. playground ball or something, which is pretty big, pretty broad. Like yep. you're not getting pokey pressure on anything. Yep. You're just, and, and, and typically, uh, you know, for that kind of thing, a client will typically go like, uh, if it's really, really painful, they'll, they won't stay there. Yes. <laughs> right. There's a certain aversion if it's really painful. And oftentimes it's just uncomfortable. And that's different than like, oh, this really feels really awful. I'm going to, I'm going to move. Uh, and I start with something kind of big and broad. And I'll often, I also say, if I'm teaching somebody to do that, I'm going to have you set the timer for 15 seconds. Yeah. And I'm going to have you just do 15 seconds. Like you go on, you breathe three or four times, you come off it. Yep. See how you do that day, the next day, et cetera. Then we sort of slowly build that up. I'm, I'm really cautious with starting that, although it can be incredibly valuable. That's the challenge, right? If it yes. works, it's like a miracle, yep. really valuable. you just got to approach it with, with a lot of caution. How I teach uh, this is I use a ball that's about four inches uh, around. Yep. And it's got some firmness to it, but it's also a squishy, a little bit squishy. Yes, uh, uh, me too. Yep. And I tell them, okay, find the ASIS between the ASIS and your belly button. Put it in that area and gently lay yourself down on it. See how it feels. If there is no pain or discomfort, you're probably not in the right spot. Because if right. anybody's ever had palpation done properly to the psoas, you know when you're on it's it. It's not subtle. It is not subtle. But one way that I have discovered that really you can tell if you're on it or not is if they're on a spot that makes them go, oh, yep, I feel this. But they're not 100% sure is take your toe, sort of dig it into the ground of the same foot. And with your quadricep, not with your hip, with your quadricep, elevate your knee. Because basically, you're going to be stretching that hip flexor just slightly. And if you're on the psoas, you're going to feel the stretch increase. And you're going to feel the intensity go up from like a 6 to a 7, not to a 10. Mm -hmm. And when yeah. they do that, they're like, oh, yeah, that went up. I said, okay, we know you're on it. If you're not yeah. on it, if you're just in another area that may be tender, because let's face it, how often do we poke ourselves in the abdomen? Right. So it may be tender in general, <laughs> right? but you know, that way they're like, oh yeah, I feel that. And I may have them pump it up and down a few times, a little active, isolated, you know, release mm -hmm. type work, uh, yep. just to get it. And then I could say, okay, let's move up or down slightly and sort of follow yep. the track. You can only go so yep. high cause it goes so deep in the abdomen to the lumbar spine. Yeah, you run your ribs pretty quick, but yeah. Yeah. But that's one way that I can tell them if they're on it or not, first of all but also get them to gauge. And I tell them intensity, five to six. I'm not looking for a 10. If you're hitting a 10, back off, back way off. So. Yeah. Just. Yeah, so there's there's part one of our troublesome triad. Yes, that's the first bit. That's the first bit. Now, um, one other step on that is Think, thinking about like a lot of it for me too is where does that come from, right? Why does, why does that get tight? Yes. And, and, and what do I need to do to make that less tight? So one of the things that is a general comment I'll say about the psoas, the cordial borum, and the piriformis is all of those will try to act as postural stabilizers mm -hmm. if the core is not really doing its job very well, yep. is, is how I put it. I'm not just entirely true, but that's how it feels. Um, and these guys are not designed to do that. It's not really, they're, they're not mechanically in the right position for it, and they're not really designed for it. But they will do their best mm -hmm. to, to help. They're very helpful. Yes. Um, and and so, so with that in mind, what I, I want to do a lot of times with these muscles is, yes, I want to release them. And then I want to try to make them dynamically strong within their full range. Mm -hmm. Right, because what does the psoas do? The psoas basically lives at a right angle, holding you in a sitting position for many people for multiple hours a day. Yep. Right, so it, it starts to get short. So this gets into another piece of muscle spasms is it starts to get short, or at least it, it just has to hold that position for hours and hours and hours. And when a muscle has to hold a position relatively statically for a long period of time, one of its one of its strategies is to lay down more fascia, thicken the fascia within the muscle, right? So that basically it's it's stabilizing the muscles. I think of it as putting rebar inside your concrete, mm -hmm. 
right? It really, it's like the fibers just get thicker. And the thing about fibers getting thicker is fibers are not, well, well, uh, they don't have a lot of good blood supply. They're not nourishable in the same way. They don't get nourishment in the same way. They tend to be more just fibers that are living there doing their thing. And so they will tend to decrease the blood supply to the muscle over time just by replacing muscle tissue with fibrous tissue. Now, when we're talking about fascia for the fascia uninitiated out there, are we talking about the thoracolumbar fascia? Uh, in this case, we're really talking about the intermuscular fascia. Okay. Or the intram, I should call it the intramuscular fascia. Okay, so the fascia so the within The fascia it. that is within the muscle tissue itself. Gotcha. Right, right. So it's not so much the outside or even the connection between the muscles, but it really is what's happening inside the muscle tissue itself. You know, every every muscle cell is surrounded by some a little tiny bit of fascia, and then that that makes a little bundle, and that's surrounded by more fascia, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, until you get the whole muscle that has a, a big pile I of see. fascia around it. I so see. it's really that that yep. that fascia within the muscle. So those muscle fibers get a little thicker fascia coat, if you will, and that again is going to decrease the amount of blood supply, decrease the amount of nourishment the tissue gets, mm -hmm. and make it more likely to um, spasm. And the way around that, at least in my in my mind, is movement. Yes. Right? Move that muscle through its full range of motion as much as you can because that will decrease the likelihood of that, that fibrous tissue building up and increase the stimulation, the circulation within the muscle, which mm -hmm. makes it healthier. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Now, something that you told me a long, long time ago that I never really – I never thought about. Okay? I never really thought about this, but you – brought up the fact that the psoas really likes to contract the most or at its greatest muscular advantage is when the hip joint is actually bent to 90 degrees and above. So bringing that knee forward and above the 90 degree mark above horizontal really is what's going to separate the iliacus from the psoas and the psoas does more work. Well, I wouldn't say the iliacus and the psoas because those guys really work together as sure. flexors. But what it does is, is those then take the job above 90 rather than the rectus femoris okay. and the sartorius and the tensor fascia lata. The more superficial hip flexors mm -hmm. um, don't have a good mechanical advantage above 90, which the iliopsoas does. And I, I, I'm, I'm combining that into the iliopsoas at right. that point. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So, so that's where like doing a high march, mm -hmm. for example – Right, getting that knee above that ninety degree level, which people don't ever want to do in their marches, yep. if you've noticed. Yep. Uh, but that that's going to get more again more into that iliopsoas and that psoas major than into the superficial hip flexors. It'll start to get that a little bit stronger. I guess my thought was always with the iliopsoas complex is when you lift that knee up, you're shortening the iliacus so much that it's not really getting the same amount of contractile tissue as you are a much longer muscle like the psoas that can continue to contract, continue to contract, which is why in my mind I was thinking that it, makes sense. it does a little bit more work. But again, we haven't yeah. done EMG studies, so I can't say for sure. Uh, but it is something to think about. Uh, even what I have some clients do is just sitting in a chair, doing high knee marches mm -hmm. in a chair or exactly. on a ball. Yep. You know, on a yep. ball is a big challenge because lifting yep. one leg, you're obviously going to have a balance component. So you're working your core a lot more, but it's super challenging. And I can't tell you how many people you get them to that point. They lift up and you can see in their face like, oh, and not only is it difficult, but there might be a little bit of discomfort even. Yes. Yep. And a lot of weakness. Yeah. I, I, I've, I've had so many clients. If I just, I, I often do the seated, you know, high, high march basically. Yep. Um, Cause it's, it's the easiest way to do it. They can really feel their pelvis is staying relatively neutral or I can manage their pelvis in that position. And it's, it's the, the easiest version basically. Yep. At least that's still gravity resistant. Yep. And, and it's like, wow, they will do. And sometimes you'll find that can do 10 on one side and they'll do four on the other side and they'll get pain in the front of the hip. Yeah. Yep. Just just because they're literally, and that's just weakness in that yep. case a lot of times. They're just that weak there. So this tends to be extremely underutilized, yeah. this particular range of motion for most people. Now, would you ever use the Pilates chair to assist with that if someone had a little bit of lack of strength or lack of endurance where you can sit on the chair, put your feet on the pedals? Absolutely. And actually have Absolutely. a little bit of assistance in that lifting. I'm, I'm thinking for our older yep. clients. We have a lot Absolutely. of 65, 70, 75 year olds who don't lift their legs very much when they walk and they need to. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I've used it that way in the past to de-weight their legs a little bit. I was just curious if that was something that you did as well. 
I, yeah, all the time, all the time, because um, because you don't know the chair, like the feet are on a pedal and you're sitting on like a chair and essentially that pedal pushes the legs up or assists with what would be hip flexion if you're sitting on it like that. And then you get the concentric or the, the push down of the hamstrings, basically and pull over the quads, you go down and you kind of come up and you come down and that does de-weight that a bit. The other thing too that I'll play with on that is I will play with um, timing. Mm. So I'll have them go down fast and up slow. Mm-hmm. Right. So I'm kind of like using the, the back of the leg to push down and the some part of the quad, but not the hip flexor part of the quad or the vast eye a little bit there. And then as they come up, kind of slow do the eccentric phase of that hip flexion above 90. Nice. Because um, we know that eccentric phase is is oftentimes a really good strength builder rather mm-hmm. than the concentric phase. I do some concentric things as well, but I really like the eccentric phase on that one with the assistance. Just slow it down. Come up as high as you can, comfortably can, slow, and then push down, and come up slow. And as you do like a push down one, and then two, three, four up, and then down one, two, three, four up, something like that. Something that I'm glad we started with the hip flexor and with the ilias psoas is because so often we think about what muscles do we train on a regular basis. Yeah, we focus on the posterior a lot. And with good reason, yep. with good reason. Yes, yes, absolutely. Glutes have it a can be neglected as well. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But if you really watch people working out in the gym, I almost never see anybody do any hip flexor strengthening. It's something mm-hmm. that they almost want to avoid. And when asked about it, they're going to say, oh, they're already tight. And I have to remind people right. a tight muscle can actually be a very, very weak muscle at the same time. But, and hip flexors almost always. Yeah. And that's something that we need to focus in on, even if it's only one exercise here or there, like you say, high marches, because that's also going to test balance. Is it a test coordination that tests a lot of things? Yeah. You know, so a lot of my older clients, I may have them do a sideways walk over, you know, six inch hurdles or something like that, something small, or even just a towel rolled up on the ground. But I'll say, lift your leg as high as you can as you go over. And they don't need to know why. But yep. you watch the first few repetitions, it's up pretty high. Then it starts getting lower. Then it starts getting lower. And before long, they're <laughs> then they hitting, start hitting they're it. They're hitting right? it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I even do them facing a step and just have them do a tap on top of it. A lot of times mm-hmm. they'll put like a ball on the ground and have them tap on top of the ball because the ball will move a little bit. So they got to chase it a little bit. So it, right. it takes it more. Different angles. Yeah. Different angles. Takes it more three-dimensionally just so they can get a little bit more you know, of those angles, but also sort of for balance and stuff like that. But I think these are great ways that we can sneak it in where they don't even know they're doing it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, those are like, those are, again, super simple. All yeah. those things are really simple. And um, I've given clients things like when you're at your desk, because I have a lot of clients who sit a lot, you know, it's when you're at your desk, you set your alarm for every hour or whatever, and then just do 10 high marches and sitting in your chair. Yep. You know, sitting upright on your sit bones, stay balanced and just 10, 10 high marches. And it makes a it makes a difference pretty quickly. Yeah. It's been my experience because again, it's typically something that people haven't done anything of. Right? They haven't done any and then I always say if you if you start from zero, you make progress quickly. <laughs> exactly. And many people have not done have never lifted their hip above, you know, 90 degrees or not much. So any work at all it makes a big difference. Something else to think about for those more fitness inclined. When someone's doing a squat, what mm-hmm. muscle is really helping when you're descending into the squat that helps your hip joint basically work properly? It's the hip flexor. Yeah. So a lot of times what I will cue, I've got a machine much like a reformer. I use the reformer as well for this, but another machine where uh, they're lying down so it imitates a squat more and it's done with- The shuttle? Yeah, the shuttle. Or whatever. Shuttle yeah, MVP. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's got rubber resistance. Yep. And yep. I will have them do the eccentric Focus on bringing the knees toward the chest slowly. Yes. So yes. changing that mindset a little bit and reminding that muscle how to work that way and yes. then take them into a squat, take them into a box sit or something like that and remind them, make sure you're hinging from the hip instead of just stick yep. your butt back because that really doesn't do the job. Hinge right. from the hip. Think about bringing yep. your knees up as you sit your butt back or down, however people want to cue that. And I find that that gets them into much better mechanics. And I've actually taken some people who have had labral issues where their hips aren't working properly. And it's begun to work with that a little bit because, again, you're reminding part of the joint, hey, I need to keep the hip 
properly placed here too. Nice. So nice. It, it can help for that. One one other thing that I bring up, especially in terms of the psoas and, and the iliacus, is if you watch runners, and again, I, I tend to do this a lot. I, I walk on a couple of trails and there's a whole bunch of runners that are always going by. It's, it's like you know, Saturday morning. And I watch them run. And what I notice is a whole lot of the runners do very little hip flexion at all. Yeah. They really don't drive that leg forward. They do a lot with like that push off in the hamstring, like the back of the leg is, is really the propulsion, yep. but there's none of that pull forward with the leg. And, and, and that's also where I see that, that kind of pretty common weakness in, these are fit people. These guys are you know, clearly doing a lot of running, but they're still missing that component mm -hmm. of it. So from, you know, from a performance side, not just a pain reduction side and, and um, I always think of, you know, Usain Bolt or you look at a really good, especially sprinters, yeah. you watch them, that drive of that hip flexor forward yep. is huge. Yep. That hip flexor goes up to, you know, up to 90 degrees. It isn't just way down there doing 20 degrees of flexion. It's driving forward. And that's where you really see the power and the speed. So you know, for your performance or any clients as well, something to think about. Cycling as well. Do you think yeah. about working the whole pedal cycle rather than just the pushing yep. down. And that's yeah. how you take a beginner and make them better as you say, okay, focus on the pull, focus on the pull. Yep. And once you get into toe clips or even the toe cage, you can focus yeah. on that. It's like, oh my gosh, this makes you much more efficient, but they get yes. tired really fast. Right, because they haven't done that before. Exactly. Pro presumably, yeah, that's not, that's not where they're strong. Yeah, so that's something else. Just anytime you can add that, it really does help for performance, we find, or I find. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, one last thing that, that I want to say about the hip flexors, particularly the psoas, is yes, we want to work on releasing it, on stretching it, you know, stretching if, if you're to lunge, for example, again, that posterior tilt that like mm -hmm. bringing the bottom of the pelvis forward is often going to increase the stretch. Sometimes reaching the arm up or even doing a side bend away from the side will increase yep. the stretch. So um, ways to accelerate that. But, um, but the other thing is we want to think about with, with that area is, um, the rectus femoris and tightness in the quads Yep. because there's tightness in the hip flexors, which is deep. And there's also there's, sometimes the rectus femoris is just, is actually the culprit yep. that is limiting the range of motion there too. So, um, always making sure that you're doing both Ilio, you know, iliopsoas stretches and rectus femoris stretches, or at least identifying uh, which part of it is tighter or which part of it may be the troublemaker because they can either one can be a troublemaker there. And I find that in the kneeling lunge stretch for hip flexor, mm -hmm. if you tuck the toe under, go into dorsiflexion, it pulls that rectus femoris a lot more. And yes. I've had people just do that and think, oh my gosh, because they'll tell me I'm not feeling much anymore, dorsiflex. Uh -huh. They're like, oh, yep. holy moly. I said, okay, now we got to deal with the rectus femoris as well. Right. So it does pull that part of it in as well. Yeah. And, and or, or, I mean, with the kneeling lunge, the classic there too is just sit up. Yeah. I'm, I'm really tight. My rectus femoris always had been. So I'm kind of like, I'm hanging out over that front leg. Yep. And if, if I just even attempt to bring my torso up right, it's like, okay, I get it now. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, ouch. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> Very good, very good. So that is our hip flexor, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, just so everybody knows, we're gonna be doing this in multiple parts, okay? Yeah. So we're gonna cover hip flexor today, we're gonna now get into the quadratus lumborum. Uh, when we're finished with all three, we're going to combine all, all of them and see how they work in conjunction with one another, especially when you have clients who have sort of conditions here and there, whether low back pain, hip pain, labral tears, all that kind of thing. We can deal with all of that. So that'll be part of part two. So now let us talk about the quadratus lumborum. All right. And this is one I, I, I don't like. I don't like it. I, I, <laughs> not your friend. Not my friend, man. I have had <laughs> issues with mine probably for the last 10 years, chronically uh -huh. tight on one side, no matter how much I release it, no matter how much I, I literally get up in the morning and have a routine where I have to release it, stretch it, release it, stretch it. And then I can start walking and I'm fine. But if I don't do it right away, that just tightens up and it gets cranky the rest of the day. 
Yes. So, you know, and I'm thinking, man, it's been how many years that I've been dealing with this, but you know what? That's my cross to bear, uh, <laughs> so to speak. But let's talk about the anatomy and then we'll get down into the nitty gritty with it. So the cordatus umborum is interesting because it connects our 12th rib to the bottom of our rib cage, goes along the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebra, again, often skipping five, and then goes along the iliac crest. Mm -hmm. So once again, it is a multi-joint muscle. Mm -hmm. It also is connecting our rib cage, our spine, and our pelvis, right? And, and those can be moving in a variety of different ways relative to each other. And I think that's what people are missing. Every time I've mm -hmm. seen this drawn in anatomy books, all you see are a lot of the fibers basically saying, oh, it goes from the 12th rib down to the hips, down to mm -hmm. the pelvis. And it's like, no you're missing a huge component. Huge component. And every single uh, vertebrae is its own joint. So you're talking yep. about a multi, multi, multi-level muscle. And if any of those have dysfunction, it can affect this muscle. And it's, a, it's the same way with the psoas. So bringing this into the QL, yeah. right? These guys both, the, the psoas actually attaches to the lumbar discs. Mm -hmm. there's, there's connections of its fibers with the lumbar discs. So if there is a disc problem, if there is a nerve pinch, if there is any of those kinds of things, those nerves go directly to or through or into these muscles, yeah. either the psoas or the QL. So if there is any kind of low back you know, pathology going on that's going to influence the, either the discs or the nerves, then those muscles are going to go into some kind of trouble. They'll either shut off or they'll go into spasm or they'll be, they will be reacting in some way to that nervous stimulation. Yeah. And something that I found interesting that I didn't even learn when I was doing pre-med uh, studies was that the fibers run three different directions of the yeah. QL. So they go from yep. the ribs to the pelvis, they go from the ribs right. to the vertebrae, and then they go yep. from the vertebrae to the pelvis. So they're actually running right. three different ways to give us incredible yep. support, incredible dynamic stability. Yep. But man, when something goes wrong, something can go really wrong. When any, right, so when any one of those fiber angles, for whatever reason, posture, habit, injury, uh, you know, structural issues, uh, gets particularly tight, like one of those, and you really feel, I mean, you can probably feel it somewhat on yourself, like that band is what's really tight, right? That direction, oh, yeah. whether it's up and over, right? Or I, I rotate a little this way. You can feel like kind of which bands in there get particularly tight. Yep. Remember we talked earlier about fibrosis with the psoas. QL is classic. Mm -hmm. The QL2, like much like with the psoas, um, the, you know, the psoas helps us to sit up, so it's it's not dynamically used when we're sitting. The QL almost almost more so has less dynamic range because most of what it's doing is tiny little micro adjustments between the rib cage and the pelvis. You know, if you're walking, even if you're sitting, you know, you lift, you shift your weight to one side, you shift to the other side. That muscle's going like I was. This is a funny noise, guys. It's kind of goes. E, 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 e. Right, little tiny contractions to maintain the integrity of that whole area. That's its job. It's a major stabilizer, um, or a major, yeah, you know, it's a major stabilizer in that sense. Um, and that's and that's tricky. It doesn't it doesn't get nourishment. It doesn't get moved through its full range unless you do a pretty big side lift, yep. side bend, side sit up, um, something like that. Otherwise, it's working in a tiny range all the time and loves to get fibrotic. Yep, and it's just that's its. Think about what we do all the time. I mean, you and I are doing yeah. it right now. Yeah. We're just sitting. Yes. yes. You're sitting here. My back is against the back of the chair. Yeah. My QL doesn't have to do a whole lot except for those little bitty movements when I lean a little bit side to side, but I'm not putting it through great ranges of motion like no. I would be if, let's say, my past generations, I was out working in the field. I come from farm stock. So working out in the field, lifting, toting, you know, come from one of those countries that, you know, people, you know, die early, but are in the fields until the day they die, just <laughs> lifting and toting. And die with their boots on. Exactly. But when you, that's what our back was meant to do was to do a lot more work. So when we're sitting yeah. here all the time, yeah. we give yeah. it the opportunity to get fibrotic. We give it the opportunity to limit its range of motion. And then when you ask them to stretch, that muscle's like, excuse me, you, you, you want me yeah. to do what? Huh? <laughs> Say what? Exactly. <laughs> and that can be an issue. 
That can be an yeah, issue. Everybody absolutely. thinks, oh, I can easily side bend from side to side. But you look at a lot of people have limitations there, at least to one side or the other. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, 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 and weakness too. Mm -hmm. You know, I always find that the areas that I find the most obvious imbalance on from side to side is a side sit up yeah. with anybody. You know, I have them do a side sit up on one side and I'm side sit up on the other side with whatever, you know, box or roll or whatever I'm using. Um, and man, one side will be like easy. The other, the other side, they will literally look at me like, how do I do this? Yeah. Like they don't even have the coordination on that side. Uh -huh. And that's where, again, like, how do we how do we make this muscle more nourished, decrease the fibrotic tendency of it mm -hmm. um, and, and decrease the, the likelihood of spasm? And a lot of it is trying to trying to make it move. Yeah. You know, trying movement, to give it some some range. Yeah. Movement is always going to be the key. I mean, in, in case you all haven't figured it out. Movement is the key to a lot of what we're doing here. Just, just so you know, it is the key to life. Uh, but for the QL, I find movement can be really limiting for a lot of people of one side or the other, especially if they have yeah. low back problems, especially if, the, yeah. if one side is, you know, I'm not going to say spasm, spasm, because, you know, we all know what a spasm feels like when I, I, I can't move. But those almost, I'm going to say a microspasm, a small spasm that they move in, it's like, ah, it, it limits their range of motion. You need to be able to get greater range of motion. You need to be able to stretch and get better mobility there. I find that doing release work, again, with the small ball up against the wall, sort of running it along. I'm not a big fan of running along the spine or the ribs, but along the iliac crest, where a lot of people have a tendency mm -hmm. to feel it the most that really works really well. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I, I try and stay out of the softer areas, the areas that, you know, you don't really necessarily want to put a lot of pressure on your lumbar discs uh, or the lumbar vertebrae or your floating ribs. So, you know, I try and stay off of that area, but you can affect a change by hitting the entire iliac crest and just finding those hot spots where you find something and say, ooh, yeah. And I just lean into it, breathe, mm -hmm. breathe into it. Yep. And a lot of times people go too fast. They don't go slow enough, you know, and when you find one of those hot spots, oh, you're going to know it. It's not subtle. No, no. And, and one, one of the things that, that I want to say is we talk about like, you know, micro spasm because there's spasms where it, this, this is why we call this a troublesome triad, right? Because when these, when these really go, when you really get a major spasm in the QL or in the psoas, like you can't move. You know, that, that's the one where the client comes in, they're completely, the rib cage is over to the right or they're hunched over yep. and they're like, I can't straighten up. That's a, that's a major spasm. But you guys can do this with me now. Actually, if you find your waist and you put your fingers in your waist, it should be squishy, so relax. I know it's kind of ticklish. And you come around to the back, you'll feel a big band of muscle there. That's sort of, it's a lot of things, but it's one of it is the edge of your quadratus lumborum. And very often when you put your thumb on there, you'll feel like this is true in any area that's a little spasmy. It almost feels bruised, mm. right? You put a thumb in there and one side feels like, eh, it just feels like tissue. The other side feels like eh, a little cranky, a little bit like somebody hit me with a baseball bat and I'm in the middle of a bruise. And that is that feeling that that area is denourished, that it doesn't have enough blood supply that's got a buildup of of gook and glue, um, the, the pH has gotten a little bit lower, the ions aren't working the right way that they're supposed to work there, and, um, and that causes pain. That increases the nociceptors in the area. So that's uh, one of those things that, again, that's one of the things you'll feel in an area that is in kind of a microspasm, if you want to use that term. Same thing with the piriformis. Mm -hmm. You put your thumb kind of in the middle of your of your butt cheek, if you will, and one side will feel normal, and one side will feel like, again, like kind of bruisey. And that's often a sign, again, that those tissues are not getting quite as much stimulation or nourishment or blood flow as they need. And, you know, waste products essentially are starting to build up and it's not getting the, the circulation it needs. How I've described it to clients is it feels ropey. Because if you've ever done any uh -huh. manual therapy, and I've, you know, yeah. I have, uh, it feels like you're hitting ropes. You yes. know, I've felt this in multiple areas, especially when you're talking rotator cuff, quadratus lumborum, certain areas yeah. you just sort Fibrous. of hit. And it's like, D -d 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 -d. it just feels like you're yes. hitting ropes, whereas the other side feels, you know, smushy. And it's yes. good. It feels just like it should. It's nice and relaxed. And one side, you can definitely feel those knots. Uh, 
So those knots that we're feeling, that ropiness, that's really sort of malnourished tissue, you're saying? That's one, I mean, again, that's one theory, but yes. Waste products, and, and it just, it also may be that, that, that fibrous tissue is developed in there, yeah. right? That you've lost some of that squishy muscle tissue and you're replacing it with, you know, Folgers Instant Coffee. You're replacing it with, <laughs> with fibrous tissue, right? That it used to be nice and soft and squishy and elastic, and suddenly you're just putting ropes in there to keep it stable and to help to help it to, to, to stay as strong as it needs to stay to do whatever it's trying to do on a, on a postural level. Which is why we still need to strengthen these muscles, not just do the release yes. work because... yes. The release work is good and it will do some of getting rid of some of those knots, some of that ropiness, but not all of it. Mm -hmm. And it does take a long time. I'm still working on mine every day. It takes a long time, but also if you ignore the strength aspect, the trying to get the strength part of it, you're never really going to develop enough strength to stabilize that area. Right, because, it, yeah, and that, that, that's how I think about all of this is like if I can really work the psoas dynamically, if I can work the quadratus and borum dynamically, um, again, both with release work and with mobility work and with strength, I, I think of it this way. I just think like all I'm doing when I'm doing, let's say, like a little side sit up or something mm-hmm. like that is I'm taking those tissues and I am compressing them and I'm elongating them and I'm compressing them and I'm elongating them and I'm pumping blood into that area. Yep. Um, and, and with that, especially if you do a pretty full range of motion, if that's available to you, um, then you've also got some of those fibrous tissues are going to be breaking down, mm-hmm. right? Because muscles are constantly re- re- remodeling. And that means I can actually start to get that range back and I can replace the fibrous tissue with muscle tissue over time and make that gl- area glide more mm-hmm. and be much less prone to, to trouble. Let's talk about mobility because, again, y'all know, wrote a book about back pain, the Low back has been sort of a area of intense mm-hmm. interest for me. I've been focused on this for many, many years and studied a lot. And what I found is stretching the QL, depending on what's going on with their low back, you need to sort of take different approaches on how you're going to stretch the area. Uh, yes. Because a lot of people would just say, well, just do a side bend. Well. Yes. If I do a side bend in a sit- seated position, but if I have a disc issue of any type, or if I mm-hmm. want to drop the knees to the side, lying on my back doing, you know, or even doing something like uh, telescope arms or a pinwheel, uh-huh. where you're going to stretch out the QL, or starfish where you're coming across the body, all of those are great exercises and great stretches. But if you do have some disc mm-hmm. issues, Doing some rotation may not be warranted in that area. Might irritate things. Might irritate, might irritate things. things. Might not. Yeah. It might not. Yeah. It's just something to be aware of that you might want to take it a little slower and not get as aggressive because we see a lot of people like if a little's good, man, a lot's going to be a lot better. <laughs> take it a little slower. Go a little less range of motion. Sort of approach that range of motion. Then say, okay, that's all I can go today. Fine. That's all I can go today. The fine. Before you know it, you have increased range of motion. You're going to get it to move better. But I find Mm -hmm. that rotation may be contraindicated depending on what's going on with their body. If they go into that position, that side bend, and they feel a lot of discomfort there. Stop. Stop. Back away. Back away. And I find that there's other ways where you can uh, stretch it. Two, three ways that I've done it uh, with clients that I find very good is over a large ball. Uh huh. You know, where they literally are, the ball is supporting them and they can literally lie over it. And what I'll do yeah. is I'll have them position themselves near a stationary object with their hand so they can uh-huh. grab it with their hand and let their hips yeah. get heavy on the other side of the ball. So you got a little traction going on. Yeah. And that can get a little, a little deeper when they're ready for it, because that can be a little aggressive. Uh, and again, that's more of an advanced technique. Another way that I do it is sideline. Yes. Is just have them lie down on their side and go on to their elbow like they're going to do a side plank, but keep the hips on the ground, straight leg yep. position, and just push up. And, and kind, of, kind of drop the ribs a bit yeah, toward the ground, right? Exactly. Yeah, so you really are trying to stretch the ribs from the pelvis on that bottom side. Exactly. Yeah. And I find that is one of the best ones that seems to be safest for just about all uh, spinal pathologies that I've seen. They, nice. They don't go into too much of a side bend, so gravity's not pulling them toward the ground. They're pushing up against it a little bit. 
Mm -hmm. And it just opens things up and they can stay there for 15, 30 seconds, 60 seconds. It's not a difficult position because it's not like they're doing a side plank or anything. Right, right. And the other one that I will give people is just to hang from that side. If they can find something that they can, you know, a pull up bar or something like that. Or a door frame. Door frame. Or a Pilates world, a, a trap table. You know, and it's just hang on with, and I, so if we're still hanging on with both arms, yep. so just very gently unweight your legs. Maybe you just bend the knees exactly, and then take one arm and just do like a monkey hang, basically. Yep. Exactly. I also, also on, on even a simpler level, so, so two things. One, to use a, a big ball, I'll sometimes use a big ball, I'll use a Pilates arc. It's oh, often yeah. a really nice way for somebody to just lean over sideways. They yep. can take that arm up and yep. pull that arm a bit. It's pretty gentle. Again, most people can tolerate it. The other one is standing. Uh, reach both arms overhead, hold on to one wrist, and yep. just pull sideways. Sometimes yeah. that's pretty mild. Yeah. And I'll do that just as a warm up, just kind of like, you know, very gently going into that. Mm -hmm. And that'll often, again, give, give a nice, easy uh, way to do that. Nice, nice. For working the muscle, first of all, I got to tell you a pet peeve. I can't tell you how many times I see this in a gym. Someone goes and they grab two relatively heavy dumbbells, one in each hand, and they start doing side bends. Oh, yeah, no. I call that TikTok it's just, because it's literally compression. it's compression because you're holding, I, I see women do 15, 20 pounders where I'm thinking that's a lot yeah. of weight and you're doing compression on each side. But also yeah. as I go to the left, I'm lifting the right and the left is pulling the right up and vice right. versa. If you're going to do something where you want to mm -hmm. elevate or lift dumbbell in one side, keeping it lighter is often, you know, a better way that I would do it if I wanted to uh -huh. do a side bend. Yeah. But yeah, doing it with both hands, not great. It's just going to be a lot of spinal compression. And as you go to that side, it's even more. Yeah. And if you do have a disc pathology, that's one way that you're just going to tick you things off. the heck out of it. Yeah. You know, one thing I love to give clients, and it can be very challenging, is just sitting on a ball and doing hip shift side to side. Yep. 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 It's simple, but I can make them yep. do it for minutes at a time. And again, as a dynamic stabilizer, we're looking for endurance. And I, and I do the same thing on a reformer carriage. If it's mm. a if it's a fourteen inch reformer sitting on the carriage, no springs. Yep. Right, and sitting sideways, feet on the floor, and basically shift the you know shift the carriage right, shift the carriage left, shift yep. the carriage right, shift the carriage left. Uh, really super simple that way, and yeah. that's a nice way to do that. And I do yeah. it for time again, two minutes, yes. three minutes. Yep. And you can have yep. them do it at home if they have a ball that they can use at home. It's a pretty easy way to do it. And I've even had people do it at their desks. I have them buy like a Dyna disc or flatten yeah. a Togu ball or Something. a Pilates ball so they yeah. can sit on it. So it gives them a little bit of buoyancy and just shift side to side to side to side to side to side. And believe it or not, they say, wow, it gets tired. Yes. And after about a minute and a half, you can see they're not doing the same range of motion anymore. And in it's almost funny to watch their face because they're like, they forgot how to do it. Their body's not, uh -huh. their brain's saying it's not work, but it's not working anymore. <laughs> and it just gets so fatigued. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. and you just have to get that to have a lot more, not only strength, but endurance. Yeah, I do that. Um, uh, again, in a Pilates environment, sitting sideways on the reformer, there's mermaid exercise called mermaid, which yeah. is the classic side side exercise there. But I'll do it with the feet on the floor again with a 14 inch reformer um, and a hand on the foot bar. Yep. And again, I may have light springs, I may have no springs. And again, so the feet are, are stable, pushing the hips over, pushing the carriage over, and then a side bend toward the hand that's on the foot bar. And then coming back, find the range that's really comfortable there. Another one that tends to be comfortable mm -hmm. for a lot of people with with other issues and I can keep them very you know very in the frontal plane if I want to really just focus on that I can minimize rotation or I can add rotation yep. and I can make it really small or I can make it bigger so lots of nice ways to make that dynamic and what I like about One, that is yeah. you is you have the progressions built in yes exactly you can add and, and, and you can just talk more. them through it yeah exactly I and like easy that. to just build it up yep um one other challenge that I find is uh and I bring this up because it's another exercise I see a lot for the dynamic QL that, that I find both great and problematic, which is basically standing, let's say, on a small box or a block mm -hmm. and just doing a hip drop and a yeah. hip lift. Yep. And 
And while I, I like the idea of that exercise, I find if somebody has a sacroiliac joint problem, if somebody has a piriformis problem, if somebody has a disc issue, yes, man, will that, can that irritate it fast? I, so, oh, yeah, I completely okay. agree. I have seen yeah. that because I see a lot of people, they come into me and if they've had this issue, that's one of their exercises or if they need yes. to get their, they need to strengthen their gluteus medius. And yes, yes. that's a gluteus medius strengthener and it is a hip hike. But like you said, if they upslip uh, to that mm -hmm. side. Yeah. If there's any instability in there anywhere. You're, you're asking them to immediately go into yeah. that and you're just going yeah. to exacerbate the condition. Yeah. I am not a fan of that exercise whatsoever. Yeah. I just, there's too many variables that can take it in the wrong direction with that, especially doing it at home for them. Yeah, that, that do. I mean, again, this is one of those exercises where, you know, Brian and I have done this long enough that, that we've, we've tested all these things out over the years. <laughs> and that one, man, I am just, every now and then, it will be the perfect exercise yeah. for somebody, um, which is great. But boy, it is not a first, it's not a first go-to, it's not a second go-to, it's down the line. Yep. And and sometimes I'll do it like, I'll, I'll do it differently where they just stand and just try to float their foot a quarter inch off the floor. Yep like a tiny, tiny, tiny hip hike. And because I find what's particularly problematic is the drop down, Yeah. right? So going below neutral with that standing leg, below the ground essentially, because you're standing on a block and that lift up. So a lot of times I'll just say start on the floor and just a tiny little hip hike. Sometimes yep. I'll, I'll, sometimes I can work with that safely, but man, the full drop of the hip is like, mm. yeah, seems I've, to cause shearing forces. Yeah, I've, I've seen too many injuries from that. Uh, yeah, me too. That it's not yeah. worth it. And yeah. Agreed. And something that I've always mentioned to my trainers here is what's the risk reward? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. If there's too much risk. Is it worth it? Yeah. There are there's a hundred so, ways to do something. Thank you. Exactly. Do there, it a different way. Find another way. If you're working QL, yeah. there's another way. If you're trying yeah. to work the gluteus medius, I can give you 10,000 gluteus medius exercises that won't yeah. have the same effect as that one does. Exactly. You know, exactly. and the same risk, the chance of risk. So yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that one because it's one that I've taken out of my brain. I can't tell you the last time I've asked someone to do that because I just think it's too risky a maneuver. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually with you. It's just, I wanted to bring it up because I know I've seen it a lot and, mm -hmm. and I, I don't teach it and I, and I don't do it for that reason. And it's like, okay, let's just, uh, let's just uh, bring that up. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about doing something? We've talked about side sit-ups, which again, we can yeah. do it on the arc. We can do yep. it on, you know, a large ball, ball, bolster, everything. Big ball. Yeah. yeah. So many different ways we can do it. That's a great way to stimulate those tissues. Yes. Uh, what do you feel about side planks? How do you feel about those? Um, I am, a, I am a big fan of side planks mm -hmm. because people tend to get so, 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 so weak there oh in the whole side body, yep. right? It's not just the dynamic ability to actually flex and you know, laterally flex the spine, but just the whole side body. And I'll modify it like mad. Yeah. You know, I'll be on the forearm with the knees on the ground, yep. right? Or like the lower leg on the ground, do a tiny little, like, you know, the mini one, the modified version of a side plank. Yep. Um, I also find, you know, once you're, once you're getting into that side body, it's not just the, the QL that feeds directly into the AB ductors and the strength or weakness thereof. Yep. Right. And so, and, and, you know, whether you're doing it for just pure stability and just like up and down, up and down, up and down, or going up and then doing a little what you were talking about of dropping those hips and coming back, creating a more dynamic mm -hmm. action, Right. Again, in that modified version with the plank on, yep. and, you know, with the forearm on the ground and probably the knees and the lower leg on the ground as well. Those are I, I think they're fabulous. And again, sometimes with a client, I'll, I'll put my hands at their at their their limiting point. Like, yeah. oh, OK, only drop to my hand and it's yep. an inch and then come back and drop. Because I know if they go past that, they sometimes can't come back. Yeah. yeah. If they're really weak. Right. And, and, and I think that builds up that whole side body beautifully. And what I've noticed, not only on my own body, but on clients, is one side will often be a lot stronger than the other. We see an imbalance here. A lot. A and lot. I love the side plank because it demonstrates that imbalance. Yes. And if you just do a plank, for instance, my own body, I can do multiple minutes without even thinking. It's not that difficult. But a side plank on the side that my QL is a little bit testy. Yep. Yep. 
I can do about half the time that I can on yep. my, you know, stronger side. And yep. I know it. I mean, I can feel the difference. I had a client yes. today. He said, I feel like these are two different bodies. He said one yes. side, I feel like I can do this all day. The other side, after 10 seconds, he's shaking. Absolutely. And it's like, okay, you're done. Okay, pause. Let's try it again in a second. And just the yeah. weakness is there. So you can see that even in a regular plank, chances are one side is probably working 60, 40 to the weaker side even. Or sometimes for me, because if I don't, now I'm, I'm quite consistent, but if I wouldn't do stuff for my left side, mm -hmm. I mean, literally, I could not do a side plank on that side because I got so weak wow. just just from not doing stuff. Just because I, you know, I got leg length difference and other kinds of things. If I do it, I'm I'm, I'm good. But man, I've got to keep that side up. Mm -hmm. And you also think about three dimensional core support. You know, going back to, you know, low back pain 101, three dimensional core support, front, back, and side. Yes. You know, and and if you don't have that, that's going to put unequal forces through the spine, through the hips, through the whole structure. Yep. Yep. So, no, I love it. Love the side plank. Something, Big fan. another exercise I'm just going to throw out there for everybody that I like, I like unilateral loading. Yes. So oftentimes I will load, you know, put a tube, put a band, something around a stationary object, walk sideways to it, arms extended. So you're derotating. So you are getting that QL, you are getting the oblique, you're getting the entire torso. But what I find is if you take the hands from a straight arm position in front, take them overhead. Suddenly, mm -hmm. now you're basically oh, holding yeah. a side plank yeah. in a standing position. So nice. it challenges it differently. And as you're moving through that arc from being in front to overhead, you're changing the angles constantly. Oh, I like that. So That's cool. It's, it's just one of those things that you can wake the muscle up. And again, you can make it easy. If they can't do a side plank on the ground, I can take a light yellow band and only have them basically holding up three to four pounds. It's not much. Right, barely, barely putting tension on it. Right. And take it overhead. Mm -hmm. And even when I take it overhead, sometimes I'll just start tapping the band so you get a little bit of that to pull them in, a little per bit of per perturbation going on. Yes. And yes. it just wakes things up so we can get nice. more strength and then begin nice. to progress them from there so that I can have them do something like a side plank down the road. This is for people who yeah. that can't. But I'll also take my big, strong guys Put a heavier resistance there. As soon as they go overhead, you see them toppling over and they have to really yes. anchor themselves and they say, wow, I can't believe how hard that is. Yeah, nice. So just another option to think about. I love it. You know, ways to do it through mobility, like a lot of the mermaids and Pilates, and ways to do it through stability. Yep. You know, all the side plank work. And I love, I love doing a vertical version or an upright version of the side plank challenging the stability of the sides, right? The whole yep. side body, but from an upright position. That's fabulous. Yeah. So just some different things to think about, gang. Now listen, Love it. that was part one. We got lots that was part more. One. We haven't even gotten into the piriformis. We haven't even gotten into the piriformis. <laughs> and then we want to get three-dimensional about this. We want to see the body in motion and not just yep. think like a lot of people do about specific body parts or breaking it down into just one thing. Let's put it all together. Let's make it three-dimensional. Let's have the exercises. The yeah, we're going to work it yeah. the whole thing. So we're going to get that in our next episode. So part two is awesome. coming up next time. So thank you guys for joining us. Uh, our social media stuff, uh, again, at movingconvos at gmail.com. Uh, movingconvos at, on Instagram, on Twitter. Uh, come check us out. And yeah. From North St. John, I'm Brian Ritchie. We will see you next time. Bye, guys.